Good afternoon, everyone. We want to welcome you to the inaugural Edible Inquiries Food Policy Research Connections webinar hosted by the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. My name is Rachel Santo, and I'm a Senior Research Program Coordinator with the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future's Food Policy Networks Project. Karen Basrab, a Program Officer, and Ann Palmer, Program Director at the Center, are joining me in the room. This new Edible Inquiries Web interactive webinar series is part of our broader efforts to connect researchers and food policy councils with the aim of fostering research on food policy councils in similar groups that is relevant, proactive, and responsive. Each quarter, we will invite researchers who have explored topics relevant for food policy councils to present their key findings for discussion with participants about the impact on food policy groups and additional research needs. Today, we are pleased to welcome four researchers who have recently published academic research about monitoring the internal organization and evaluating the external impacts of food policy groups. So why are we discussing research on monitoring and evaluating? We understand that monitoring and evaluation can be time and energy intensive. However, they're critical to effective functioning of any organization. Monitoring an FPC's structure and processes can help the group understand if its current setup is working and to know when modifications are needed. Evaluation helps a group assess the extent to which its programs or policy goals were met and to demonstrate whether and how its policies or programs affect the community or the issue. There are many different tools and research studies that could be used to monitor and evaluate the structure, functioning, and work of food policy councils. Our presenters today are going to talk about specific tools that they have used or developed, the context for their use, and how practitioners may apply them to their work. Before we begin, I'll introduce the speakers and review the format of the webinar. Anna Maragas Foss is a research fellow at Cardiff University School of Geography and Planning in Wales in the United Kingdom. Her research interests revolve mainly around sustainable food systems, food security, rural development, rural urban linkages, sustainable food planning, collective action, social movements, and participatory action research. Larissa Clancy is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina Center for Health Equity and Research. Her research interests include nutrition, health disparities, food systems, cross-sector collaborations, and system science. Caitlin Marquis is the Healthy Hampshire Coordinator based in Hampshire County, Massachusetts. Her work focuses on food system policy and program planning with a partic particular emphasis on equity-focused community engagement and advancing food justice. And last but not least, Jill Clark is an assistant professor at The Ohio State University John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Her research interests include food policy and practice, centering on community and state governance of food systems, the policy process, and community engagement. If you would like to suggest themes or new research for future Edible Inquiries webinars, please post about it in the Lumio Research Forum, which we'll be sharing the link to in a moment. On this online forum, we encourage food policy councils and similar groups to post about their research needs, such as data collection or impact analysis. Academics and students may also post their research topics and themes to solicit participants. We also plan to update our annotated bibliography of research on food policy groups in the next few months. So please post about any new research you're working on on the forum if you would like for us to include it in there. Let's also briefly review the webinar platform we're using today, which is called Zoom. All attendees are muted and will remain in listen-only mode during the webinar. We have incorporated some polls and open-ended question, open questions throughout the webinar. For the polls, you can indicate your choice by clicking on the appropriate buttons. Sometimes the questions in the polls are multiple answer selections, so you can choose as many as you'd like. For the open-ended questions, we encourage you to type your response into the chat box. You can open the chat box by clicking the chat icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can choose who to talk to by clicking the gray more button in the bottom right hand corner of the chat box. If you have thoughts about the webinar after it has ended, you can continue the conversation on the Lumio thread. We're going to intersperse these poll questions throughout each presentation, presenter, uh, presenter's uh, presentation. So be, be aware and on the lookout for, for those questions. And also you cannot, uh, we can't have you talk on the webinar. We can only have you chat. So if you raise your hand, we can't actually ever unmute you, so please do type into the chat box. 
after all the presenters have presented, we will open it up for Q&A. At any point during the webinar, you can type a question or comment for any of the panelists or audience into the Q&A box, Q box and we'll answer it during that session. Please try to type your questions into the Q&A box and then reuse the chat box for responses to our poll questions. Finally, we'll be recording the webinar today and we'll send out the link to the video and a PDF of the slides afterwards. Now, before I hand it off to the panelists, I just want to explain a little bit more about who we are. The Center for a Livable Future is an interdisciplinary center located at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our work focuses on the intersection of diet, the environment, food production, and public health. The Food Policy Networks Project is one of the CLF's projects. The goal of FPN is to build the capacity of food system stakeholders to reform local, state, regional, and tribal food systems through effective public policy. We do that through training, sharing best practices, networking with other food policy groups and leaders, and developing and providing food policy resource materials. If you aren't familiar with FPN, we encourage you to check out our website and sign up for our listserv to hear about future webinars hosted by FPN. And this is our website here. Okay, so before we kick it off by giving uh, the stage over to Larissa, we're gonna start out with a poll question. Let's see if this works. So the question is, what data, metrics, or processes do you use to track and evaluate your council's work? You can select as many choices as you'd like. And if you have other options, because we could only put this many here, please type them into the chat box. This was just our first initial guess at what you might be doing. All right, we're about to end the poll. Um, please, if you, you have 10 more seconds to uh, add in your, your thoughts before we move on to Larissa's presentation. All right, thanks. We'll do more polls throughout. And you, you can still also type into the chat box afterwards if, you, if you're still reflecting on this question. All right, and here's just an initial share of the poll results so far. All right, Larissa, do you want to take it uh, take it from here? Sure. Let's see if I can get myself. Can you see me all right? Good. Um, and now I'm going to share my screen. Um, All right, let's get this into presentation mode. Can you all see my screen and hear me all right? Okay, good, thanks. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited about this webinar series. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Larissa Colancy. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at UNC. Um, I'm gonna be talking about work that I conducted as a doctoral student in the nutrition department also at UNC. And, uh, I'll be talking about the Food Policy Council self-assessment tool. So I just wanted to give a brief uh, background. So I was thinking of Food Policy Councils as organizations that bring together representatives from across the food system to do three main things, to identify issues and opportunities within the food system, to coordinate food-related programs, and advise on food policy. Um, as someone who was in public health and in nutrition, I was very interested in Food Policy Councils because I think that they have the potential to be hitting these bottom levels of the health impact pyramid 
um, they have the potential to change the context in which people make decisions related to their health and also potentially change socioeconomic factors, which if you look at this pyramid, um, these lower levels, the levels that make up the base of the pyramid are really where you see a large population impact. So that was kind of my initial interest in food policy councils. Um, and I started looking into the, the literature to see what kinds of research questions I could tackle as part of my um, dissertation. And I saw two main gaps. Um, there's, there's plenty more areas of, for potential research in related to food policy councils. But I noticed that there was a real gap in knowing kind of the internal how do councils function um, to influence their food system. And, and then the, another big question is what impact do they actually have on their food system? Um, in order to make this manageable, I focused on the first question, so looking more at internal council capacity and what they're doing as organizations. So um, part of the goal of my research was to develop a food policy council self-assessment tool. And to, to start that off, um, I started with a literature review to figure out what a conceptual model would be or should be to guide um, the assessment tool. So I wanted to know from the literature and research that had been done before, what are important concepts um, for community coalitions, for collaboratives, and for partnerships. Um, as you can imagine, there wasn't a lot of research available um, specific to food policy councils. So I was looking at community coalitions and collaboratives and whatnot that were health oriented. Um, and I was looking for those that had kind of process as well as effectiveness measures. And I found this um, conceptual model that I loved. It was um, published by Dr. Nicole Allen and colleagues um, in 2012. And this is from a published paper called Changing the Text. And they were looking at uh, community-based collaboratives that were actually trying to prevent, prevent um, uh, domestic violence. And they were pulling lots of different uh, sectors of the system together to improve the system's response um, to domestic violence. Violence. And even though that was a very different topic from food policy councils, I felt like the internal function of those kinds of collaboratives were very similar to what I had observed um, were important factors in food policy councils. So their model shows um, effective leadership, an inclusive council climate, breadth of active membership, so having a really broad um, representation of sectors that are um, related to this type of work. Um, knowing that there is some sort of formality in council structure, so there might be working groups and there's some sort of rules related to how people um, work within the council. Those would all be important to produce social capital within the council. And then having social capital along with empowered members and a supportive community context could lead to institutionalized change. So in order to adapt that to food policy councils, I kind of rearranged these concepts a little bit um, and grouped together leadership council climate structure and membership into a bigger bucket called organizational capacity that would be associated, I thought, with social capital, which we thought of as like knowledge sharing and relationships between council members and member empowerment. And we thought that that would ultimately lead to council effectiveness and ultimately, ultimately lead to community outcomes, which we didn't measure in the study, but um, I think we'll hear more about research in that area later in this webinar. Um, so we thought of council effectiveness as synerg synergy and perceived impact. So really thinking about whether or not the council is able to do more than just, it's more than the sum of its parts. It's able to um, bring together lots of different perspectives and come up with a practical, um, practical solutions to hard problems. So this was the model that was driving this assessment tool. These are the definitions of these different concepts that were in the framework I just showed you. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see them. Um, you can refer to them when you get the slides after the webinar. Um, and so on to the actual self-assessment tool. Again, we were really trying to understand um, what factors were important for um, internal council capacity. So we adapted questions from Dr. Nicole Allen's work and other studies, and we, those questions asked about members' perceptions of their council. We got um, feedback from experts who are working with food policy councils to ask whether or not Account, the questions actually made sense. We asked, uh, we spoke with survey design experts to see, you know, in terms of survey development, are these um, good questions, basically. And then we um, programmed our, qu our questions into an online survey platform called Qualtrics. 
and we asked um, four Food Policy Council members to actually take the assessment um, and kind of talk talk through it as they were taking it so we could get a sense of whether or not the assessment made sense or where we need to make changes to make it um, more helpful and, and make more sense to council members. Um, and so the resulting Food Policy Council self-assessment tool had about 120 questions. We've since made it shorter, so um, it's even faster to do now. But a lot of the questions were looked like this, where there was a um, question stem and then the specific questions below it, and then your answers were on a scale. So you could uh, participants were able to go through the questions relatively quickly. Um, so our goal was to collect data from all food policy councils in North, Car North America, which is um, quite a lofty goal, but we were able to recruit in conjunction with the 2015 Food Policy Network um, Food Policy Council Directory update. Um, and so some of you on the call may have, have um, rem may recall getting an email about this and may have actually um, participated in this study. So thank you if you did. <laughs> um, and thank you also to the Food Policy Network for being for allowing us to recruit through this um, directory update. So we sent out a link to um, collect the data and we sent email reminders to um, council, council um, uh, contact people and there was a small incentive including feedback reports. We offered um, summaries to councils where eight or more participants, eight, where eight or more members participated. And these are some initial results. So you can see that most of our, the participants were female, um, predominantly white, and there's an, a large age range. And we had a mix of, of members, of people who were members of councils as well as leaders. Um, and there was kind of a range of the amount of time that members had been part of their council. And these were the different sectors that participants said that they worked with. Um, and these sectors were not mutually exclusive, so I think participants were able to say maybe two potentially more sectors that they were affiliated with. Um, so you can see that nonprofit was the most commonly represented sector and faith institutions was the least commonly represented. And this is a map showing where all the food policy councils were located, um, who had participants that responded. And yeah, there was 94 councils in total. And so I just wanted to pause here and ask the audience, for those of you who are members of a food policy council or who um, are part of some sort of similar organization, what is your council's greatest strength? So I kind of breeze through these, but thinking about these different concepts um, of leadership, whether or not you have um, a broad range of sectors represented, uh, whether or not your council has kind of a shared vision that would be inclusive council climate, whether people, whether there's like shared decision making, um, if there's a formal structure, whether there's knowledge sharing, is there a relationship between members, um, is, does participation empower members? Um, yeah, you can see these, the, these different areas for strength. So if everyone could just click on what you think your council's greatest strength is, we'll give you a second to do that. I'm not sure how long we're waiting for. We can give them another like 30 seconds or so. Great, thank you. Got another 30 seconds. This is one of then, two questions. And then Larissa, let's, um, if you could go ahead and summarize in like a sentence or two when we're done what the results are in case there are a few people calling in. So. Okay, sure. Just remember that. Okay, um, Thanks. and I'll, I'll be able to see the results, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so it looks like knowledge sharing is um, reported as the greatest strength among council about among um, participants on this call, followed by relationships between council members and what okay, and those are the greatest strengths. Okay, and then let's go to the next question, which you might imagine. Let's see. Uh, what is your council's biggest challenge? So 
same, same response options, where do you think you could really improve if you had the opportunity? I guess we'll give folks another 30 seconds or so, Rachel. Yeah, about 20 seconds left. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, so um, folks responded that they thought their council's biggest challenge was impact in the community with 40% of um, pollsters reporting that. Um, and then that was followed by breadth of active membership, where 20% of respondents said that that was their biggest challenge. Thank you all for, for participating. Um, so that brings me, let's see if I can advance my slides here. Um, so how does that compare to what we found when we asked councils across the country? We found that the biggest strength actually was leadership. That was the uh, concept that was rated the highest amongst all of our participants, which is a little bit different than what you all said here. And then where they said their greatest challenge was, or the lowest score, was breadth of active membership. So that is similar, um, and that was the second um, biggest challenge that folks on this call identified. Um, on this call, you all said that perceived impact was um, one of the biggest challenges, which you can see here is also one of the lowest scores according to this sample. So um, you all are pretty similar in, in terms of where you, where you saw, where you see strengths and, and challenges in your councils. Um, so back to the conceptual model. So this Ultimately, the Food Policy Council self-assessment measures all of these concepts, and then we wanted to know, do these concepts um, fit together the way we've put them together in this framework, but, um, according to the data that we've collected? And so we use structural equation modeling, which I'm not gonna go into here, just to test whether or not these pieces fit together the way we thought. And we found that they generally did. Um, generally, we saw that um, an increase in organizational capacity measured by these constructs, climate, council climate membership, structure and leadership, would lead to an increase in social capital, which would lead to an increase in council effectiveness. But we decided to change around um, the way that these variables relate to each other a little bit by creating a direct link between organizational capacity directly to effectiveness. So what this is saying is that by increasing organizational capacity, you're not only increasing social capital, which in increases council effectiveness, that you can directly increase effectiveness by increasing organizational capacity. Um, and so we ended up revising our Food Policy Council framework to show that there's this direct link between organizational capacity and council effectiveness. Um, and we described that in a paper that I think we, there's, it's available um, through the Food Policy Network. So we hope that this framework can help um, councils think about how these different components of an organization fit together, of how their organization fits together, how these concepts are related, and then the assessment tool helps you measure these concept, concepts. So to conclude, we think that we have a strong assessment tool. Um, you can use the, the assessment tool to evaluate concepts associated with internal council capacity. Um, in terms of application, we think that, that we can help, this um, assessment tool can help compare kind of internal capacity across functions by having a common measure. It identifies area, areas of strengths um, and, it, and areas for improvement and maybe helps councils prioritize where they might want to strengthen internally. Um, it could help be helpful for evaluating capacity building intervention. So if you're working, if you're receiving technical assistance, this can help get a kind of before and after look at whether or not that technical assistance um, influenced the, the organizational components that you cared about. Um, we hope it encourages funding by just um, making things a little more standardized. 
and uh, we got some kind of insight related to Food Policy Council trends as well. Um, we, for example, we noticed that there, we might need more research on how to um, engage a more a broader membership base. And we hope that the framework advances understand, our understanding of how food policy councils work internally um, to influence their food system kind of more externally. Um, so I think it's important to uh, look at where in the community food policy councils can have their impact. We actually just got a, um, a manuscript accepted last week that um, it explored a little bit about community level impact. Um, there was a question on the Food Policy Council self-assessment tool that asked about impact, and so that paper should be coming out soon. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting to do, to look at capacity building interventions using system science. And I think a really important area of research is quantifying impact on community level outcomes. And I think some of these components are being spoken about later on in this webinar. So I'm really excited to hear the rest of the presentations. Um, these are some resources. So you can actually go on this link and use the Food Policy Council self-assessment tool. I am happy to create a uh, feedback report, kind of a summary and send it back to you. Um, these are the two articles that I kind of summarized. And just very quick acknowledgments, this is my committee and the institutions and funding that helped uh, make this research possible. And a big thank you to Ann Palmer and all of you guys at the Food Policy Network um, for making this work possible, as well as the participating councils. Thanks. Thank you very much, Larissa. Um, we'll have some great questions for you, and we're going to hold them until the end of the webinar. Um, sure. And before we, before we move on to Jill and Caitlin, we're just going to share another question for everyone and this is one uh, that you'll have to answer in the chat box but the question is if you had the help of a graduate student or a university faculty member what topics would you like to help help with researching about your council so if you could just write or chat your thoughts into the chat box we'll also repost this question and give you like a you know 30 seconds to a minute to put it in there um, and if we have any in innovative or um, common ideas that rise to the top, we'll definitely uh, discuss those during the Q&A session. All right, Jill and Caitlin, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you and then we can have people typing it throughout the webinar, so I'd like to add their thoughts. Great, thank you, Rachel. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about a local food, food policy audit. And what I wanna do is start by giving you just a little bit of context on what, get, what, what gave rise to the audit. Um, the Franklin County Local Food Council, uh, which both Caitlin and I are involved in, um, was started in 2011, and it, at the time it was a, it was a newish coalition, um, and, but it was built on a, his, a long history of food work in the community. And um, you know, while it was formed in the model of a food policy council, you'll notice that the word policy is missing in its title, um, which really for many of you um, who on the call, you may um, not think that this is strange because it's really not that uncommon. Uh, the reason at the time that was given uh, by members as to why policy wasn't in the name was that they didn't see the relevance of the, um, of the political world in, in their work. Um, and, it, and really, from my perspective, it was um, partly about not knowing how the work or the vision that the, the group had, um, how, uh, how its guiding principles could be supported by local government action. And so, um, you know, in light of this, you know, how might members of this budding policy council um, who share beliefs on what the food system um, could be in their community, uh, see their work in policy terms and, um, thereby you know, building local governance capacity, because there's a lot of expertise on the council. Um, and, and how um, can that expertise be leveraged into creating a more supportive policy environment? So I won't spend a lot of time on our theory of policy change, um, but if you're interested, there's a couple of resources. Um, 
Larissa just mentioned her piece coming out in JAFSED, Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems, and Community Development. This piece is going to be coming out um, in the next uh, um, issue as well. And um, the good thing uh, for those of you on the call that may not have access through an institution is that this um, is now given the support of many, um, including uh, the network, is um, available um, open access. Also, you'll see a link there to a, um, I think, a, a nice document that talks about theories of change. And, and um, it's, I think, a, a um, really good place to look if you're just starting to think of you know, how policy change happens. Anyway, the main point of using the Advocacy Coalition framework is just to say that um, it's a theory that helps us um, talk about how the Food Policy Council um, got oriented to policy and became policy ready. And that Advocacy coalitions are, are groups of people that um, are bounded together by a set of beliefs on what um, could or should be, um, and that those beliefs are bigger than themselves. And you can see here the mission of the Franklin County Local Food Council. Um, so this is what the group was subscribing to. The other point to make here is that the coalition, um, advocacy coalitions also uh, tend to include decision makers themselves and sympathetic staff and also researchers and the idea is that within this group of that shares a belief, they do co-learning together. And that's where the audit came in. Um, so what is a food policy audit? It, it, you know, at the core, it's a type of assessment. And assessments are common um, starting place for uh, when, when coalitions like this get started. And, um, you know, it assesses the policy environment. And the key for our group at the time was that it was a way to translate that um, mission I showed you earlier into policy categories, really um, demystifying um, policy by demonstrating, uh, you know, what can government do to support our, as you saw earlier, mission and um, principles, really articulating, you know, what are the types of policies that would exist um, to really have a supportive um, environment so that we could achieve our objectives. But it, it's just a scan of the environment. It's kind of like a scorecard. Um, it was, um, we modeled ours after the one in Virginia and um, refined it for Central Ohio. And now you can find one through uh, the University of Wisconsin. And there's um, links to all these resources at the end of the presentation. And now I'll pass it on over to Caitlin. Thank you, Jill. Um, so I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about the development of the audit tool. So I was, I came to this work actually as a graduate student, um, and I essentially, I just was interested in working with the Franklin County Local Food Council on something. Um, talked to Jill and a staff member for the council, um, and Jill felt, and, and they both felt that it would be um, good for the council to start thinking about their role in policy. Um, and so... They, we sort of like threw around this phrase food policy audit and I didn't even really know exactly what that meant, which is um, how I came upon the uh, tool that Jill just mentioned from O'Brien and Denkla Cobb at the University of Virginia. Um, and so I decided to, um, you know, probably one of the most effective ways to do it would be just to take that tool and adapt it for Franklin County. Um, so I brought that idea and the tool to the rest of the council um, and got their feedback and, and input on priority focus areas. Um, and based on that conversation, we took some items out of the tool um, and we also added some in um, to be better fit with our priorities. So for example, at the time, the council was really interested in food waste. Um, and so that was one of the categories that we added. Um, and we also increased the focus in the tool um, to kind of look a little bit more at rural to urban land use um, and agriculture in those different environments. And that was sort of just based on the development patterns of the county that we were looking at. Jill, can you transition the slide, please? So this is an image of the scorecard. Um, and essentially it ended up being a 100 point scorecard. Um, I divided it into four categories and 18 subcategories um, based on the priorities of the council and then um, conducted the audit specifically at the county level. Um, and so what it was really was just a policy checklist where the um, policy items are phrased as yes or no questions. And there were several different sort of categories of, of things that we defined as policy. So it could be laws like zoning, um, it could be declarations or goals, so things that appear maybe in planning documents that have been adopted by the county. 
um, could be pro programs supported by local government, whether they're supported with money or space or staff time, um, and then also resources offered by local government. So it could be informational resources or technical assistance that the government has available. Um, and I conducted the research to complete the audit tool through snowball style key informant interviews um, and also reviewed some public policy databases and documents. So if you look at the resource column of the audit scorecard, um, you can see you know, what some of those databases were. And then um, there's also the agency department or organization. So those represent some of the folks who were interviewed to get answers about uh, those questions. Next slide. So when I was getting stakeholder input, I um, talked to stakeholders in both the public and private sectors, um, and I found that private community-based organizations, like you can see Local Matters and the Mid-Ohio Food Bank um, are two that I interviewed, um, they were sort of more readily recognized their role in the food system, um, and they could speak from the perspective of doing policy advocacy or intera uh, interacting with programs that were supported by local government. Um, and then public stakeholders, there's a lot of different public stakeholders there. Some of those sort of more readily saw their role in the food system than others, um, but there were some like the county purchasing department or the emergency management department um, that didn't really think of themselves as, as food system stakeholders, and yet they still had really good um, answers to some of the questions that I posed. Um, so these interviews with stakeholders not only serve the purpose of gaining information, but also raising awareness among the stakeholders of their roles in the food system and also all the different policies that affect the way the food system operates. Next slide. So this is a summary of the results um, that we got and basically they just allowed us to see sort of overall areas where the county was doing well, um, like zoning and land use policy and then areas where the county could be doing better like public health and food access. Um, and I use these results to generate a list of recommendations that I put in the audit report. Um, and I believe that audit report is in our resources um, slide. Um, and then based on those recommendations, and um, we had some policy items that um, we could perhaps focus on, and we had the food council members um, rank those, rank them to determine their policy priorities. Um, and that led to some key outcomes that Jill will discuss in a little bit when I hand it back to her. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so I thought it would be good to talk a little bit about what the audit does well and what it doesn't do well. If you're considering doing something like this in your community, um, it would probably depend on what your goals are. Um, so some of the things that the audit does do well is um, it orients the food council to the idea of working on policy, um, what policy entails, all the different things that sort of fall under the category of policy, and then also the nature of the food policy environment in which they're working. Um, it's a the process of it is really valuable. Um, the product is valuable too. It's not that we should just throw out the product, um, but it's also not where the work of engaging with the local policy environment should end. Um, it's a great internal capacity builder, so it helps council members better understand their role in food system governance. And it's also a relationship builder in that it helps um, stakeholders on the council understand their relationship to one another, um, but also helps connect the council to external stakeholders and decision makers, and that grows the coalition of food system advocates. Um, and it's one of many ways to set priorities for a food policy council. There's a lot of other ways, so it, again, it depends on what your goals are. Um, and then finally, it's, it, you end up with a tangible product. And so that is a way to provide a platform for conversation. So you can do that um, you know, within the group, the Food Policy Council. You could bring the results back to the stakeholders um, that you have engaged through the process. Um, and then you can use it to start new conversations with community members, stakeholders, decision makers, et cetera. Um, and then just to cover some of the things that the audit maybe wouldn't be so useful for. Um, it's not really a useful tool for inclusive community engagement. It didn't really meaningfully engage marginalized stakeholders in any way. Um, it's not a way to evaluate how appropriate any given policy is for the locality being audited. Um, so it doesn't say, you know, we know that this policy doesn't exist, but it, it doesn't answer the question, should it exist here? Um, 
it's not really a tool to assess a council's readiness to engage in policy, um, but I've been informed that Johns Hopkins has a tool like that called Get It Tool Together, which is a very cute name. Um, it's not a diagnostic tool, so it shouldn't really be treated as a final word on policy in, in your locality. Um, it doesn't necessarily like, it's not, it's not official. Um, and then it's not also not a prescriptive list of policies that um, every locality should have in place. So I would encourage any communities who are interested in using the model to go through some sort of assessment process first um, or visioning process to really determine you know, what the priorities of that locality are. Um, before undertaking the policy audit. But I do want to point out it can be really challenging to sort of work from that level um, up, you know, so sort of identifying maybe what some of those gaps and opportunities are and then identifying what the corresponding policies are that um, might address those. But I did provide some resources at the end that um, are great for sort of understanding the whole world of um, food policies that exist out there so far. Um, and that's why I'm going to turn it back over to Joe. Great. So as, as Caitlin mentioned, you know, there's this product in the end, we had this audit. Um, and, but it really, um, it's really the, the platform that it was for conversation that resulted in things happening in our community. Um, it, it enabled the council to feel um, more efficacious in the area of policy knowing that they could start a conversation with our locally elected leaders and here you see our county commissioners um, as a result of our first conversation um, passing a resolution formally recognizing the role of the council in the community um, it went on to having conversations with and expanding our coalition by talking um, with others around like a double up style or um, incentive based program at our farmers markets. We held listening sessions uh, and then we had a program publicly funded as a result of momentum behind that. We could also have a conversation about um, zoning uh, in the community and ultimately it really queued up our, our council to be able to um, play a role in the local food action plan, um, which um, was just finalized over the course of a couple of years. And so, you know, simply how do you know the audit is, is right for you? Well, the audit could be used for a lot of things. Um, I could envision people using it as like a bench line, um, but for the way we used it, which was really to um, articulate our mission and vision into um, um, a policy dialogue, um, we would say first, you know, having that um, central belief of what the food system should be like to, that glues you all together, that becomes the objectives by which you're looking at whether policies would support those objectives. That should be in place. You know, is it a group that wants to orient itself to public policy? And that's really what this did for us. Um, it is about process. And so committing, um, committing to uh, the process, not just while it's happening, but the post-process commitment to using the audit as that platform for conversation. And then going back to the, the guiding theory that we were using around policy change, do you have sympathetic decision makers and or government staff as part of the group? Why is this important? Advocacy coalitions are really around co-learning together using technical information. The audit was the technical information and we, um, um, the council was the space for co-learning. So with that, um, we did inc we're included in our slides some resources for building an audit, uh, including where to find um, examples online, um, the open access articles, and then as Caitlin mentioned, there are plenty of databases to use to um, spark ideas, and we have a, a nice list here. And of course, we'd like to acknowledge um, not just the Food Policy Network for, for hosting, uh, allowing us to be part of your inaugural um, uh, kickoff for edible inquiries, but also um, our funder uh, here. And so uh, with that, I will pass it back on to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Um, before we go on to Anna's presentation, we're going to do another, um, another open-ended question. So I'm going to share the screen. And so our last question uh, asked you more about what your council, what type of research your council could, could use help with. And this question, which we're also going to encourage you uh, to chat in the chat box, is what, types, what topics would you like to see examined in the literature about food policy councils in general, about the whole movement of food policy councils that's growing in North America and in Europe? Are there collective impacts that you would like to see evaluated? Um, anything along those lines. And so we'll, we'll keep it open in the chat box and you can 
uh, continue adding those throughout the presentation or at the end as well. Um, and Anna, with that, we, you can go ahead and uh, start sharing your screen and we'll move this question into the chat box. Okay, so um, should I start or should I leave some time for the questions, Rachel? Did you did you ask um, how long you have, or if you want to leave time for questions? I can leave some time for questions if you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to to leave like fifteen minutes or so at the end um, for for Q and A for everyone. Okay. No, I th I thought the question in the chat. Okay. Anyway, I I will oh. start. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the Centre for a Livable Future for inviting me to be part of this, um, of this webinar. Um, as Rachel said before, I am Anna Moragues and I, I'm based at Cardiff University in the UK. And I'm going to present uh, a piece of work that I've done with the um, Sustainable Food Cities Network and um, the toolkit, we call it Making the Case and, and Measuring Progress. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit first about the Sustainable Food Cities Network. Uh, so the Sustainable Food Cities Network is a network of cities around the UK. And at the moment, there are more than 50 cities that are part uh, of this network. And you can see here the map on how they are distributed across the whole of the UK. Um, and, the sustain and in order to be part of the Sustainable Food Cities Network, you have to have a cross-sector partnership, what you normally in the US call a food policy council, but we call usually here a food partnership and this cross-sector partnership has to be made up of public agencies, businesses, NGOs, community organizations and maybe as well academic bodies. In order to be part of the um, Sustainable Food Cities Network as well, you have to have, you have to develop a joint vision and, and common goals and this may, might be in the form of a charter or, or, or a strategy and you have to set up there how collectively you think about sustainable food and how healthy food can become a defining characteristic of, of your city. And the last thing that is encouraged and required is to develop an, an action plan that leads to measure improvements in all aspects related to food, health and sustainability. So the idea is that uh, cities that join the Sustainable Food Cities Network have a partnership, so they are working together across the different sectors within the food system, and they also thought together about how they are going to do that. So they are actually um, designing their strategy and their, and their action plan. So um, the Sustainable Food Cities Network and me from Cardiff University, we started thinking about uh, measuring impact and, and why was this important. And, and some of the things that were coming up in our conversations were, were these ones that are listed here. So from a practitioner perspective, um, it was important for uh, people on the ground working in these food partnerships to uh, know what was the impact of, of the projects. Uh, first of all, to show to funders that what they are doing is, is, um, is important, but also to get new partners on board and also get institutional actors on board in terms of supporting their work, not, ne not necessarily through funds, but also in terms of uh, maybe other type of resources. And also it's important to know the impact in order to improve uh, the work of a specific project. Policymakers were interested to know the impact of specific activities because uh, well, in the age of austerity, uh, with the limited resources, it was important to know where they could invest more effectively to achieve the outcomes that they have maybe on their, on their own plans at the uh, local government or in terms of the public health uh, institutions and so on. But also in terms of, of food partnerships or food, or food policy councils, there were questions that are still there in some ways about how can we measure the impact of, of working together, how can we select where are the most effective programs and where are we going to uh, put our limited resources? And also how do we measure progress at the city level? Not thinking only about specific programs and activities, but what's going on in a specific territorial place. So these were all the challenges that we were facing and why we started in, in this journey that we're still continuing. Um, and I'm going to tell you now a little bit more about uh, the process. So, the idea was, um, I've been working with the Sustainable Food Cities Network for uh, four years now, um, and we have a close relationship in terms of research, and also I participate in the Cardiff Food Policy Council, and I've been close to the network since almost its 
the, there was a demand from this network and a specific cities to measure impact. And we hosted a seminar in Cardiff around the future of our food. And we started thinking about indicators and what is out there and what we need to do. So we started thinking about how we could link research and practice and, and develop a process of, of participatory action research. We thought it was important to do this from the bottom up. Um, so that we were taking into account practitioner needs, perspectives and knowledge, that it was not an academic exercise. So in, in other words, that it was useful for the people that were on the ground. So that's why the idea of a toolbox came about. And in order to do this, we got some uh, funding from um, a research council here in the UK. Um, at very, very few uh, support, like very little support, but something that allowed us to get started. And this is more or less the methodology, the process, as is uh, highlighted over there. We started with a literature review, then we conducted workshops, had a broad consultation, uh, and then application of the, uh, of the toolbox. So um, the literature review, you can access it there, you can see the link. Uh, so we were looking at what is being done in terms of um, measuring progress at the level of uh, food systems, but also in terms of cities. So we were looking at things such as at the local level, the exercise that the Rua Foundation and colleagues from Canada and FAO are doing in terms of mapping and assessing sustainable city region food systems, and that's a tool that you can find online as well now. At the national level, there are measures, for example, in the UK, such as the sustainable food systems indicators that uh, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs developed in 2013. And there are also like uh, global indicators, as it just, uh, to the one for the from the Sustainable Development Goals. So you can see um, uh, some of them there. So in the literature, we try to collect this, all these things and understand a bit what is the, the, the picture in terms of indicators, what are people looking at and why and how we try to combine these things in a way that, are, that is useful. So after the literature review, what we held were participatory workshops. Uh, we had four workshops uh, around the country in Cardiff, London, Edinburgh and, and Liverpool and more than 100 participants came over to the workshops and we had uh, academics, we had people from public health, we had people working from local government, people working on consultancies, civil society organisation, businesses. So we were very fortunate to get uh, loads of uh, people with a lot of, of knowledge um, on the ground uh, coming to this, to this space. Still thinking about indicators is challenging for everybody, so uh, that was a bit of a challenge still. Um, an important thing when you're thinking about uh, trying to develop indicators is to get um, a framework. So we decided there are different ways of uh, different frameworks that are out there in terms of theories of change, in terms of um, causal effects and so on. But uh, um, with the Sustainable Food Secrets Network, we decided that the best approach in this case was a theme-based approach and goal-oriented. So these are kind of like the key elements of our framework. First, having a goal, for example, having a, an overarching aim, healthy cities. Then an outcome, uh, a position that is reached when the, the goal is achieved, for example, low incidence of diet-related illnesses. And then an indicator that allows us to measure progress towards the delivery of that outcome. For example, the decrease in the number of diet-related uh, uh, illnesses and the incidence of the diet-related uh, illnesses. So from this framework, what we did is asking first participants um, what is a sustainable food city? What does this mean to you? And people were writing down things. Um, we uh, were collecting all of them and then together clustering them under specific uh, themes. And these things at the end were econ economy, economy, health and well-being, um, environment uh, and governance. And these are kind of like the overall themes that we're working across and where we set up a specific goal. So quite linked to sustainability and, and social aspects are included there mostly on the health uh, dimension of things. But at the same time, when you're developing indicators, one important thing is to think about how are you going to select those indicators? What type of criteria do you want your indicators to meet? We started with the SMART criteria, which are indicators that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. But when we open up the discussion to have it with the groups, many more criteria came up uh, and we ended up with this long list of criteria. Not all of our indicators meet these criteria, but, uh, but we thought it was a very important exercise because it was a way of um, expressing what actually people need and in terms of collecting new data in the future, 
uh, maybe thinking about how we can develop indicators that, that match with this criteria of being available, low cost, accessible, relevant and useful, comparable, time, credible, collectively generated and diverse. So a, a long list of, of, of criteria. So once we had uh, clustered those uh, goals and, and outcomes, for example, in the case of environment, um, and we defined a goal, and then one of the key outcomes, for example, was the reduction of food waste. Then we were asking people to identify indicators that they use um, in, the, in their work uh, or in the, um, that, that they are familiar with or that they would like to have. Uh, in order to measure the reduction of food waste in cities. So as you can see in, in orange here, uh, those are the indicators uh, that, are, that were identified through these uh, processes, through these uh, workshops. After that, we had to think, go back a bit to our, uh, indica to the, uh, our indicators criteria to select them, and we started selecting indicators. We also did this through a collective exercise. But as you can imagine, we had to work a lot to boil things down after having input from more than 100 people. So this is the framework that we came up with. Um, so you see the different, uh, the four elements there, the four uh, themes, governance, health and well-being, economy and environment. For each theme, we set goals. And then we define what we call meta-indicators, which will be the outcomes, the things that we want to see happening in our city. Because we wanted this to be uh, easy to apply, these meta-indicators are relatively high level. So they are things that in many cases are measured at city level or could be uh, measured easily or should be measured. Um, and then we try to link those outcomes uh, to uh, specific actions that you can take in order to improve them. So we classify those actions that we call proxy indicators as in different levels for change. This is because we thought that it was important to uh, promote action and that it, this could be used as, a, as an active toolbox, as a, as a space for inspiration. And these levels of change are through partnerships and collaborations, policies and strategies, infrastructure and planning, public services and support, knowledge and awareness, and market-based mechanisms. And all of this is backed up uh, with evidence. I'm going to show you an example so you can see a bit better how the tool works. So for example, in terms of health, the goal will be improving physical and mental health and well-being by reducing food poverty, improving access to affordable healthy food, promoting healthy weight and healthy diets, and increasing participation in food-related physical and social activities. So this is a description that you see over here in terms of, uh, in terms of the goal. Then we go to the, what we call the outcomes of meta-indicators, which will be a specific things, a decrease in the number of people requiring emergency food aid, a decrease in the number of people overweight or obese, a decrease in the number of people undernourished, and a decrease in the number in the consumption of salt, sugar, fat, and meat. So this would be those meta indicators here. And then we link that to levels of change. For example, in terms of health, if we look at the level of infrastructure and planning, um, things that the council, the local government can do is work to prevent the development of food deserts and food swamps. That would be a specific action that you can see if you're doing it or not in your specific city and will give you an idea of whether you're progressing or whether you're doing things towards uh, achieving that uh, health goal. That would be the part here. And then finally, the evidence, how this is linked to published research, but also advisory documents and case studies. So the example that I gave about the food deserts and the food swamps and, and how the council is preventing that, we linked it to different uh, pieces of evidence and case studies. So for example, this is, these are two pieces of evidence in terms of uh, uh, published research, but also a report that was uh, conducted here in the UK that supports that this type of activities actually have an impact in terms of people's well-being and health. Um, uh, for example, as it says here, um, the, um, this study showed that exposure to junk food outlets had a significant effect on child's likelihood of making a, a junk food purchase and how that uh, influences in, uh, the health. Also, we link this to a specific case studies. They are mostly based on the UK, but there are some international examples as well. Of if you're interested in developing something like this, uh, then what you can go to for some support 
for example, uh, how the London Bureau um, adopted a planning guidance to deny permission to new fast food outlets within 400 meters of the schools, or how in, in Leicester they introduced a street trading policy that prevents burger bans uh, trading outside the school. So it's a way of also inspiring uh, some action with specific examples. This is kind of like the summary of the toolbox and uh, what we aim to achieve with this toolbox is first uh, for local practitioners, we want to help them to make the case for the local food program. We think that particularly uh, establishing the links between the types of activities and the evidence that supports the, uh, those activities as effective in terms of, for example, reducing uh, the uh, uh, likelihood of overweight or obesity, obesity in children, help, help them uh, establish conversations, for example, with um, health authorities in order to uh, look for synergies and maybe not also uh, have support for the, for the program. But also it's a way of helping to plan and evaluate their work in terms of what they are doing and how uh, it relates to other aspects of the food system. And in terms of the local authorities and commissioners, we think that uh, these two books uh, can have a robust, a comprehensive, provides a, a, a comprehensive collation of evidence that shows the impact of cross-sector sustainable food programs. So it's not just about one aspect, but it can give you a whole picture of what's going on in your specific place and maybe where you need to be looking at more carefully. So just to talk a little bit about the lesson learned and some of the benefits and, and limitations of, of this toolbox. I think one of the things that is very important is that the toolbox was completely a bottom-up process and it was based on uh, people's needs, practitioners' needs and, and experiences. And, and that was something that it was very important from the beginning, that it was taking into account the needs of uh, specific places. So it was relevant to um, uh, different places uh, across the UK. And that it was meant to be a tool for action. So it's not a prescriptive tool. It's not about what you should be doing, but it's just a tool to inspire to to show, to show yourself, to uh, evaluate first what's going on in your city and what things have been done there or, uh, or you're doing and then to uh, inspire yourself to, um, to do some um, more activities or, or try to fill in the gaps there. The limitations is that it's a relatively complex tool because we are trying to be quite comprehensive. So it is not, it can feel a bit daunting when you first look at it and all the aspects, but uh, as it was mentioned before, it's an opportunity to create the connections between the different actors in your city that are working on these things. Um, the second part is that some of the measurements can be time consuming and some of the um, indicators that we were proposing, the meta indicators, they are available in some places, but they might not be in others. And we're proposing to do this at the city level, but we are also aware that inside every city there are neighborhoods that have some challenges and others that don't. So um, it can be problematic to just look at the city uh, level in that sense. I think uh, this is still more work to do in terms of showing impact because um, it is easy to show impact of one of one uh, pr a specific project or program, but the collective impact is still something that we are working through. And finally, that. Uh, Cities or municipalities are not contain entities, so there are many processes going on at the regional, national, and international level, things that are affecting cities. For example, maybe you have an amazing um, uh, program for improving cooking skills, but at the same time, uh, the same neighborhood has been, there are lots of like fast food places that are opening up or other dynamics going on that, that maybe you are not, uh, don't have so much influence on. So I think there's something around there in terms of how do you, uh, consider the things that you have power over and those ones that don't and how you kind of like plan action around that so maybe more connections not only at the city level but beyond that and uh, with that I just wanted to show you some resources in terms of the links where the things are um, you can see the the draft toolbox which is a uh, uh, at the moment, uh, no, and anymore under consultation, but under construction, because we're going to put it right now. It's a it's a document, but we're going to develop it as a uh, as an online tool that you can actually um, just uh, input information there, and you will have a feedback. Uh, and also, I wanted to put the contact not only my email, but uh, Alice, who she's the person who has been working very hard with me to develop this inside the Sustainable Business Network. And with this, thank you very much. And yeah, looking forward to your questions and feedback. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, Anna, you deserve special kudos for it being almost 9 p.m. your time right now. <laughs> um, 
Okay, we have a, several questions that have come up throughout um, the webinar, and we'll begin with some of those, and then um, panel or uh, participants can type in more Q and A questions to the Q and A box, and we'll continue to ask those. And if all the other panelists want to take off their uh, or start their video again so people can see you, that would be great. Um, so one question for Larissa: It looks like there are no or few few food business members on the food policy councils that are included in your research. Can you comment? <laughs> Here in Rhode Island, our food policy council includes one person who owns or runs a local food production business, plus two people who provide technical assistance to food businesses. In addition to the, quote, normal food policy goal, council goals that you mentioned, our FBC is also trying to improve the ecosystem for food businesses in Rhode Island. Are there other food policy councils pursuing similar goals? That's a great observation that there are few business members represented um, in the sample that we collected. Um, and I think that that's an area that food policy councils might want to invest more outreach in is, is recognizing if they have a goal related to um, kind of increasing the local food economy or potentially removing barriers for food related businesses, then they might want to seek out um, like food industry people <laughs> to be involved in the council. It can get a little tricky sometimes um, because there can be competing interests depending on the types of food industry. Um, so it, it, you might have to be a little bit strategic and think about um, who you want to be kind of recruiting, but I, it's a good observation. I think that um, kudos to the councils that are trying to, to increase their representation in their, in their councils. Thanks, Larissa. Also, just a comment that um, as part of our upcoming webinars in the future, we are uh, going to have a monthly theme about engaging the private sector in food policy councils. So, so stay tuned, participants. <laughs> um, another question is, do any of you researchers serve as members on the food policy councils you are working with or living near, or are you strictly external? Does your institution have a policy on policy engagement by, quote, staff? This is Jill. Oh. Uh, yeah, I guess you can see me. <laughs> um, so I am um, a member of my council, uh, and I am also a researcher, and uh, I'm not aware of any restrictions on what I do as a council member. Um, what, I, what I have done, though, as a researcher, um, has been, I've been very careful about um, what I've published um, that's related to um, the council because as a participant in the council and a researcher at the same time um, there are um, some safeguards to um, me um, taking um, a more responsible approach to research as a person embedded and I'm happy to go over some of the tactics that I use um, if, if anyone would like to have a conversation offline but um, so actually I would say it's the opposite I'm less concerned about I'm um, engaging in the policy environment as I am being a responsible researcher. <laughs> and this is Larissa, I'll jump in real quick to say that I helped start a food policy council in Orange County and I've since stepped away from it a little bit and I'm now trying to get back involved in it <laughs> again um, and have helped with some activities around um, kind of increasing the capacity of food policy councils throughout North Carolina. Um, so I've, I've not only been involved in councils, but I've observed a lot of different dynamics. And I did try in some of my research to address some of the themes I kept seeing. Um, and the question about participating as a researcher, I agree with Jill that you have to be kind of careful to explain what your roles are when you're doing research and be very careful of kind of the ethical conduct of research. Um, and also, I do not directly advocate for policies through the council. Um, there can sometimes be some issues about direct advocacy versus advising on policy options. Um, and then whenever I'm at council meetings, that's, I'm doing that as a citizen, not as a, or as a member of the community, not necessarily um, as a direct job function. It, it gets a little tricky, <laughs> but I do want to be involved and actually, um, you know, not be doing some doing this all from my own office, but from um, seeing what's actually happening on the ground. Um, yes, I participate as well in the Carve Food Policy Council, and um, the university I think is a is an important player in terms of um, 
uh, well, offering kind of like different resources in terms of students uh, supporting some of the activities here. And also, well, we have catering and we have space and, and we have many things that we provide to the city in many ways. So I think that that's important. I don't think it's always that easy to get kind of like um, support at different levels of university, but um, I do think that that's kind of like things that are, that are useful in terms of that. Of that. Uh, and I agree with Gil and Larissa that uh, as a researcher, we do need to reflect a little bit in terms of what is our role and how we speak about things and we're kind of like a critical friend, but at the same time uh, supporting things. So not that easy to navigate sometimes, but I think, um, yeah, very interesting and rewarding as well. And, and now I'll just add uh, really quickly that um, I think one of the um, roles we can do is bring tools to our council so that when we are in a position of having a meeting, for instance, with the county commissioners or city council, that we're presenting them with um, uh, results of a process from the community that have developed into some sort of ask, if you will, if it's, if it's that bold. Um, and then on the other point I want to make is because as a researcher, participant, um, leader, you're playing all sorts of different roles. I mean, I think transparency is um, probably at the top of the list as far as what I'm doing um, uh, with the council, regardless of if it's to publish something, um, to have students like Caitlin was a student many years ago working with the council. Um, so I, I think transparency is probably the number one um, thing that I would uh, recommend. Also, Jill and I think a student, a former student, um, also produced a really helpful uh, sheet about effective community and university engagement. Um, and that is located on the Food Policy Network's research page, which is um, our effort to start connecting researchers and Food Policy Council together so that this responsible and transparent um, interactions are happening and uh, can continue happening. Um, and Jill, to follow up, we had a, a comment in, as one of the um, chat box discussion questions that they would like to see more data and research about the impact of social networks and how food councils could collect that data. Do you want to describe a little bit about the social network analysis you've done of the Ohio Food Policy Council? Uh, sure, so we're in the middle of analyzing that data, but when we, um, so I'm, our council's part of a network of councils, which also includes other state actors. And um, during a, a, a series of listening sessions, um, we, as we were going around the state, we um, asked, we used a very simple tool that I'm happy to share, um, along with an anthropologist who does a social network analysis. Um, uh, it's just a front and back, super simple, you know, fill in the bullet or fill in the dots, write a couple names. But we were able to um, communicate with participants around the state during the listening sessions. Here's what we're collecting from you and why. Here's how we're going to use it. Here's how we think you can use it. And so what we really held ourselves to is seeing the, um, both the utility from the local group's perspective of collecting this data, plus our perspective at the st from the state level. Um, but if I'm happy to, actually, um, now that I think about it, I could share that tool with you, Rachel, um, to share with participants or post it in some way um, uh, to the group. Um, we used a, a free online um, software called, I think it's pronounced Gephi, G-E-P-H-I, um, and, um, and I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, this is a question for Larissa, I think. Um, did you ask about, this is an easy one, did you ask about retired um, as a profession for members? Um, I can't remember if I asked that explicitly, but some people wrote that as other. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, well, unless we have any other questions, um, oh, there is one that, what would be the best way to find researchers interested in working with the Food Policy Council? Mm -hmm. um, I encourage you all to join our Lumio forum, which I will uh, share right now. Um, but if any of the panelists have any additional uh, comments or questions or ideas about how they could find a researcher who would be interested in working with them, please chime in. Um, otherwise, we're encouraging participants to start using this forum. We have had some, several conversations over the past few months um, with different researchers who are talking about ideas that they've been considering, and it is a good place 
we're trying to help um, especially connect researchers who are in the process of doing research but maybe haven't published something yet just to make sure that we're not duplicating different efforts across the country or in some cases across the world that we know what's happening in different places and that we can work collaboratively together um, and maybe this is a great place to start finding researchers who are interested in doing a project but don't necessarily know exactly what they want to do a lot of times graduate students are are looking for different topics to explore and maybe um, a food policy council could connect with them through Lumio. Yeah. I'll add to that. Oh, sorry. You want to go ahead? I was just going to say Google Scholar is a free way to um, just look up, you know, if you just searched food policy councils in Google Scholar, you find all the articles that are being published and who's publishing them. And I would add, um, and obviously my, my perspective is going to be from a land grant university, which has a mission to do outreach. Um, I would recommend doing a couple things. There are a couple, there are programs that um, students tend to have to do an internship or some sort of applied work. So like city and regional planning. So if you're in a state where your land grant has a city and regional planning program, um, our program in public administration, public policy, also we have an expectations that students participate. Um, it's now becoming very common that universities themselves have offices for community university partnerships. Um, so I think that um, those are just a couple of ways of um, thinking about reaching out. Um, again, I say land grant just because that's my experience. Um, the other, um, if you're with land grant universities, is connecting to your county extension educator who may themselves not um, have either the bandwidth or the purview in that area, but will likely be able to connect you to others. Great, thank you all for your ideas. Well, I guess that concludes the first um, Edible Inquiries webinar. Thank you again to all of our panelists and our participants. Um, and we look forward to, to hosting another Edible Inquiries in about a quarter from now. <laughs> so stay, stay tuned for April or May, possibly even June um, for our next one. Thank you.